Hello again. This is another video for the Central Church of Christ during this 2020 quarantine. This will probably be the last one, at least for a while, as I have been going back to work more and more days each week in my secular job, and this week it will, it's full time again. So I won't have time to add extra videos coming on. But we have one more video together, and you can always, again, contact the Central Church of Christ in Columbia, Kentucky if you are a video only watcher and wish to learn more about the way that the Bible teaches we need to actually obey the Lord. Now I have, to begin this lesson, a somewhat surprising confession to make. I am not normal. No, this is not a repeat of last week's lesson, although I have toyed with the idea of occasionally doing two different lessons, two, the same lesson twice in a row sometimes, since when you preach what's called extemporaneously, meaning you have some notes, but you don't read a script word for word, even when you do preach the same sermon, it's different every time it happens. However, that is not what's going on. What's going on is that we have another topic which is related to me not being so normal. And so I intend to at least a little bit embarrass my wife and kids again with this, but not much, not much, hopefully. Last time we talked about honor and values and, and the way we think things through and the concepts of what we need to stand for and what we need to truly do in our lives, what values we need to hold. Now we're going to talk about a different manner of mindset, a different way of thinking. We're going to talk about ways of thinking things through. And there are two basic, broad sense, ways of thinking things through. Either we're the type who likes to plan things out way in advance and focus on getting things set up and planned out and just right, focused on the future. Or we're the type who likes to not think ahead so much, likes to accept whatever comes, likes to just kind of... Uh, a roll with the punches, as it were, whatever they are, good or bad, and then live in the moment. There are those who are more one way and more the other. Most of us are some combination of the two. There are very few people. I have met maybe one or two actual like hippie types that, that, that have been so in the moment, I'm not sure if they knew there was going to be a tomorrow. But with those rare extreme exceptions, we all tend to be a, a combination of the two. We might be a little more take things as they come, but have some general plans. Or we might be more, in my case I am one, uh, I am by nature a chess player thinking several moves ahead. I like to plan things out, but then you still have to be able to adapt and adjust when things don't always work out quite the way we want it. And so we are, a, again, with usually a predominance on one side or the other, we are a combination of the ways of thinking. But as Christians, we need to know what the Bible actually says. And on this topic, at least at first glance, the Bible almost seems like it teaches that both are the right way to do things. Almost a contradiction, although we're going to see it's not literally one. So places like Luke 14, verses 27 to 33, will tell us that we should carefully plan some things out. There it says, whoever does not... And here he's talking, by the way, before I finish actually reading the passage. He's talking about the cost of discipleship in the context. And he's basically telling people, you need to be aware it's going to be a sacrifice to be my disciple. And so he says, therefore, whoever does not hear the, or bear his cross and come after me, he cannot be my disciple. For which of you, intending to build a tower, does not sit down first and count the cost, whether he has enough to finish it? Lest after he has laid the foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, this man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king, going to war against another king, does not sit down first and consider whether he is able with 10,000 to meet his, <clears throat> sorry, to meet him who comes against him with 20,000. Or else, while the other is still a great way off, he then sends a delegation and asks conditions of peace. So likewise, whoever of you does not forsake all that he has cannot be my disciple. And so there, Jesus, and this passage is often quoted, even by like financial experts and and motivational speaking types like Zig Ziglar or Dave Ramsey, that we need to plan ahead on some things like the building of towers or the going to war concept there. Those were just examples. Generally, Christians don't have to, you know, lead a nation into war, but those were the examples he used to get the point across. Then there are other passages, and some of them are very specific, but some of them are a little more general, and we'll see some of those later. The first one is a specific one where Jesus tells his disciples when he sends them out on what we call a limited commission, meaning the on-the-job training period, where he sent them briefly away from himself to preach before bringing them back during his time there. In Matthew 10 is where we find it in the book of Matthew. 
In verses 6 through 20, he told them not to plan ahead for that, that brief mission trip to the nation of Israel. There it said, but go to the lost sheep of the house, sorry, Matthew 10, starting in verse 6, but rather go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, and as you go, preach, saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out demons, freely you have received, freely give. Uh, prepare neither gold, nor silver, nor copper in your money belts, nor a bag for your journey, nor tunics, nor two tunics, nor sandals, nor staffs, for a worker is worthy of his food, meaning they were to look for support along the way. Now, whatever city or town you enter, inquire who is, who is worthy in it, then stay there till you go out. And when you go into a household and greet it, if the household is worthy, let your peace come upon it. If it's not worthy, let your peace return to you. Whoever does not receive you or hear you when you depart from that house or city, shake off the dust from your feet. Surely I say to you, assuredly I say to you, it will be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. Behold, I send you out as a sheep in the midst of wolves. Therefore be wise as serpents and harmless as, as, uh, harmless as doves. But beware of men, for they will deliver you up to councils and scourge you in their synagogues. You will be brought before governors and kings for my sake as a testimony to them and to the Gentiles. But when they deliver you up, do not worry about how or what you should speak, for it will be given to you what to say in that hour that you should speak. For it will not be you who speaks, but the Spirit of my Father who speaks in you. Now, in that case, it was a very specific example, but it's often quoted out of context to say we shouldn't plan ahead on things. Is this an actual contradiction in the scriptures? Well, the answer is no. And that one is so specific that that one doesn't actually apply to the situation. They were supposed to be trusting in the Lord to provide for them in every literal sense on this journey. Whereas later times, you know, Paul would prepare for missionary journeys. He wasn't doing or going against what the Lord wanted. He was doing what he should do under a more normal circumstance. This was a specific circumstance. The truly biblical answer we're going to find in the next few passages we look up is that it's a combination of the two. Just like we said, we all have some combination in our personalities, but it's a specific balancing of the two. I shouldn't say specific. It is in a, a specific way, a balance of the two that is the key to either having the planning ahead mindset or the come what may mindset, and yet still managing to be faithful in Christ. In other words, we should plan ahead for some things, but realize some things can't be planned for. Even that's an oversimplification. Let me try again. Essentially, we need to combine the planning ahead when it applies, when it's possible to plan ahead. Give us ourselves an example here. When we plan ahead for a career out in the world, we need to plan to make sure, first of all, that we are something that we can be good at and can provide for our families in. That's good. But we also need to make sure it's something that fits with being a Christian. So, you know, not a drug dealer, not some other sinful type of operation there. We need to be clear on that before we ever start going down those paths. But then there's going to come things up. In my day-to-day -day job, I'm a truck driver. There are things that come up that, like the weird night shift I've been on for a couple of months before the quarantine, and now that I'm off the quarantine, the, the strange night shift I'm on again now. That happens. It's not something I ever had to deal with the first several years I was a truck driver, but it's something I'm having to deal with now. We have to plan ahead what we can, and then we need to uh, roll with the punches at what comes after that. So while it might seem like these two things don't fit together at first glance, they actually do. And let's read some scriptures that show this. Because the Bible actually tells us to plan ahead, both for our religious lives and for our everyday lives. And a couple of uh, verses are in Proverbs for our uh, everyday lives. Proverbs 21, 5. The plans of the diligent lead surely to plenty, but those of everyone who is hasty surely to poverty. So careful planning is, is, is advised here by Solomon. Proverbs 16 says it twice. In verse 3 it says, Commit your works to the Lord and your plans will be established. And in verse 9 he says, a man's heart plans his way, but the Lord will direct his steps. But we're also told to plan ahead spiritually. Ezra is touted as a great example for us because he first planned to obey the Lord, and then he actually went through the steps to do it. In Ezra 7, verse 10, this is what it says about Ezra. For Ezra had prepared his heart, he had planned ahead, to seek the law of the Lord and to do it, and then to teach its statutes and ordinances in Israel. A great example for us. We already read in Luke 14 how we had to, when we first became Jesus' disciples, Christians, we had to plan ahead and at least a little bit and decide, is the sacrifices in this life worth the benefit both here and in the next? Now, 
if we're looking at it reasonably and spiritually, the answer will always be yes, but we had to think about it. Because although we don't need to turn there, remember the rich young ruler decided it wasn't worth it. And he went away sorrowful, keeping his riches rather than sacrificing them to the service of the Lord. Another good place is Galatians chapter 6. In Galatians chapter 6, verses 7 through 10, again, the overall point he's teaching here is not just about planning, it's about actually doing the good versus just pretending to do good and so forth. But he specifically says in Galatians 6, 7 through 10, Do not be deceived, God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. For he who sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption, but he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. Meaning we have to focus on which is more important, in this case, clearly, spiritual things. And once we see that, that means we're going to struggle sometimes. This is where he goes next, verse 9. Let us not grow weary while doing good, for in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. In other words, if we look ahead and we see that the struggles of being a Christian in this world with the sin all around, with the people who don't like Christians, if we see that it is hard, but we are willing to work through it and to deal with those obstacles as they come, then we are planning ahead on that future he has for us in the next life. And so therefore, verse 10, therefore as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially to those who are of the household of faith. Then, often when we're discussing planning ahead versus not worrying, not, not, not planning for the future, people ask, well, there's a whole bunch of verses that say, don't worry about the future. And those don't apply to this because worry is very different from planning. They can't overlap. You can worry so much or plan so much that you become worried or worry so much that you start planning for something you wouldn't have otherwise. But, just by themselves, worry and planning aren't the same things. The key is to plan in faith. To plan ahead, but to accept that not everything will go as planned. And so we keep our plans flexible. We are able to adjust and adapt as obstacles crop up. Again, using another life example, when we're planning who to marry, a faithful Christian will give their effort to marry someone who is also a Christian. Now, this doesn't mean they have to be a Christian the moment you meet them. You can do what I did and go out and find a, a nice girl who, who, who's not really, you know, as I call it, a nice Baptist girl who lapsed and teach her the Bible. And, you know, then once she realizes it for herself, she will obey. You can do that. You can find her. And it doesn't have to be a girl. If you're a girl, you find a boy. But, but my point is that you need to plan ahead with flexibility. If we plan ahead and we're so focused on our goals and not, here's the key, the Lord's goals, then we will be tripped up. To be flexible in our plans with the main goal always being focused on the Lord. This is what the Bible actually teaches about not worrying about the future but still planning ahead. One of the places that it's quoted about this often and, and, and used against the planning mindset is Matthew chapter 6. In Matthew chapter 6, during the Sermon on the Mount, starting in verse 24, Jesus seems at first to say, don't do any kind of planning or preparing for this life. But that's not what he says. Notice what he actually says here. No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and earthly things. Therefore, I say to you, do not worry about your life. There's the key word he keeps using. What you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Don't worry about material things, he says. Look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are they of not more value than are you of not more value than they? Which of you by worrying, again worry, can add one cubit to his stature? So why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow, they neither toil nor spin, yet I say to you that even Solomon in all his glory was not clothed like one of these. Now if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is to, today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore, again, do not worry, saying, what shall, we eat, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knows you need all these things. And here he makes his main point, but seek first the kingdom of God, then all these other, th and the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these other things will be added unto you. There is the key. It's about the priority of it. If we keep God and his word first in our lives, and if we then plan ahead as much as we can, but remain flexible and adjustable and adaptable, 
then we can plan for things like jobs and money and clothes and food, but not get too caught up, not to be, like he said about the Gentiles, so focused and consumed by it that you can then no longer serve God because it becomes your mammon, your idol, your earthly treasure. You can't serve both. And so he concludes that section with the last verse of that chapter, Therefore do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things, sufficient for the day is its own troubles. It doesn't mean don't plan ahead for it all, but don't be so anxious and worried and upset over it that it takes you away from your serving the Lord. Then people will turn to James chapter 4, the, the life is only a vapor section. And they'll say, see here it says don't make business plans. But that's not what actually James says here. James 4, 13 through 16, he says, Come now you who say today or tomorrow we will go to such and such a city, spend a year there, buy and sell, and make a profit. Whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow, for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we shall live and do this or that. But now you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. He was pointing out that they had not taken God into their plans. That they're boasting about how they were going to accomplish things. They weren't giving God the credit for what they did. He said, if they said, if the Lord wills, you can go and plan to do your business. And then that's fine. That wasn't the part that was the problem. It was the heart problem, an attitude problem of not giving God the credit. Jumping back to Proverbs for just a minute, there's a very common memory verse that kind of gives us our steps here. Proverbs 3, 5 through 6, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways or paths or plans, in all your ways acknowledge him and he shall direct your paths or plans. Think about this for a minute. The ultimate step in this balance is to realize that we aren't smart enough, capable enough, sin free enough to plan our lives for ourselves. Even if we were completely sin free, or even if we were smart enough to do it, we can't predict random chance that comes up every now and then. And so what we have to do is first, like both James and well Solomon and then Jesus himself said, make the Lord the priority first. Make sure his will getting done, seek his kingdom and righteousness first, is your highest goal. Once you do that, everything else can fall into place. Whatever else might come, we will then be assured he is with us. He is on our side. Like it says in Romans 8, 28, we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. Or like Jeremiah wrote, and that was more about Israel coming back after the exile, but it's a beautiful verse he, you know, put on a lot of art and things like that. Jeremiah 29, 11, For I know the plans that I have for you, says the Lord, plans of peace, not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. And so he's planning for us to follow his will. If we actually do, he will care for us. He will guide us. And he will help us, even with some troubles that come in this life. 1 Corinthians 10, 13, No trial is overtaking you except such as is common to man. And the Lord is faithful, and he will not allow you to be tempted or tested beyond your ability, and but will, with the trial, make a way of escape so that you may be able to bear it. He doesn't say he'll take away all trouble. He says that he will take away the overwhelming part of it so that we can, in faith, hold on. Now, balance is often easier said than done, and it takes work to reach it. As I said earlier, personally, I tend to be more of the, the planner than the accept whatever comes attitude type person. I am by nature and training a chess player. I think at least 10 moves ahead in almost everything I do, even things that I don't really need to do it for. A hopefully an amusing example happened recently. Because of the way that Diane and I uh, had our children come into our lives, some things have happened a little out of the ordinary, a little definitely faster than normal. You know, we, we had all of our kids through foster care and adoption. So, Five years and change after I found myself a father for the first time, I am now basically about to be a grandfather, or I should say about to be, I am basically now a grandfather. After only five years of fatherhood, that's one of the things I say, I'm, I'm not normal, things have happened strangely in my life. But all of the kids are growing up way too fast. You know, Joey's finishing up high school soon, he just bought his second vehicle, he's got a good job. Last week, Zach just moved out into his first apartment, he's... Uh, got a good job and, and, and growing up way too fast. Again, he just moved out, still a little fresh. Hannah's growing up way too fast in a whole bunch of ways, that none of which are applying to this lesson, but 
they're all good except for I'm not so comfortable having my little princess grow up so fast, you know. And uh, then there's Megan, who was the first one to move out, and she just had a nine month old. And uh, I said just nine months ago, she just had a nine month old. And during her recent visit, we were sitting there and talking about the different ways that, that, they, that Alexander, who I call Lex because of Superman, uh, might, might refer to Diane and I. Diane said a long nanny. I, again, I want to emphasize not being normal, first suggested I should be called Captain, like Kirk. And then I thought, well, that's a little bit too on the nose, so I chose Admiral, like Kirk in the movies. But then I thought, just a regular Admiral is too prosaic, too everyday. I want to be called Grand Admiral. And Diane was her predictable mix of exasperated and embarrassed, like she is almost every day with me. And uh, the kids, I think, thought I was making a joke and wasn't being serious, but I was. And after a few more minutes of discussion, I told them, I, I revealed to them why I chose the term Grand Admiral. I thought ahead. Kids can't say Grand Admiral. So what he's going to, what he's going to end up doing is shortening it at the very least, and it'll come back down to where I'm comfortable, Granddad. Because where I grew up, I know moving here to Kentucky, there's 10 different names for grandpas, but where I grew up, you just called them Grandpa, I don't know, Bates, or Grandpa Thomas, or, or Granddad Charles. You might use a first name instead of a last name, but that was it. That was the most variation there was, and so I wasn't real comfortable being called a Pappy or Poppy or, or whatever that they were suggesting. But you say, okay, so you planned ahead, you made it funny, the kid's going to call you Granddad eventually if he actually follows this. Where's the acceptance part of that balance, that planning ahead? Well, the reality is, I'm not going to try to force the kid to call me anything. If he starts calling me Pops, like Diane and the kids call my dad, I'm going to be suspicious someone was meddling. I'm looking right at you, kid. Yeah. I'm going to be suspicious someone was meddling. But if he calls me anything but specifically Pops, I'm going to accept it. I'm going to love him as my first grandchild, which he is in every important way. And I'm going to hopefully be a good grandfather. You know, I, I don't know if I will, but I hopefully will be. I'm not going to try to force the issue. That's where the acceptance part comes in. Hopefully, again, that's an amusing, low-stakes example of what I'm saying. Let's all, let's bring it all back together and, and boil it down. Taking into account what we've read in the Bible and, and some of the couple of real-life examples we've mentioned, even including the amusing one there, here's the basic steps. They're simple, not always easy. We must prepare and plan ahead to serve God like we read about Ezra. This means we have to learn what he actually says in his word. We have to seek his law like Ezra. Then we actually have to do it. We have to prepare and plan ahead to actually do it in our lives. It's not easy being a Christian, at least not if you do it the way you're supposed to. It's difficult. It's a struggle. On almost a daily basis, even in America, it's a struggle. But in other countries, it's even more so. So we have to plan ahead to actually do it. And then, once we actually do it, we begin to see how those plans come about, how he does care for us in our life. And even when the random events and the troubles and the obstacles pop up, we will be able to handle them in faith because we've seen him fulfilling his will in our lives. This is what Paul did. A great example of this, and probably the last scripture we're going to read, is Philippians 4, 9 through 13. It's writing from prison, and, and he, here's what he says. The things which you have learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do, and the God of peace will be with you. And I rejoice the Lord greatly that now at last your care for me has flourished again, though surely you did care, but lacked opportunity. They had sent him some financial support. Not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. The series of steps there are very simple. But Paul followed them and they made it so that even in the middle of being in prison for his faith, he was able to rejoice and take joy and accomplish the will of the Lord. Simple and easy aren't the same thing. Like Paul wrote elsewhere, if anyone competes in athletics, specifically racing, he is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules, 2 Timothy 2.5. Being a Christian is like running a marathon. It's simple. The, the steps are simple to start and often to, to continue doing. It's not so easy to actually finish. Running a marathon is simple. I could not do it, but I can understand the concept. It's real simple. You start running and you don't stop for 26 miles. 
I barely could run a mile in my shape I am now. So I, well, I'm not sure I could run a mile. I could jog a mile in the shape I am in these days, but I definitely couldn't run 26 miles. Simple and easy aren't the same. So planning ahead and faithful acceptance aren't the opposites they appear. They are steps in the pattern to a full and complete faith in the Lord. So whichever side seems more natural to us, we need to be working on the other to bring it into balance so that they are there together. So as we begin to close our last video for now, let me ask you, have you planned on serving the Lord? Are you putting that plan into practice by actually doing what he says in his word? For example, a lot of the world will teach you what you need to do to be saved, but it's not actually what the Bible says. Jesus summarized it best in Mark 16, 16. He who believes and is baptized will be saved. Or Galatians 3, 26 and 27, where Paul said, You are the children of God through the faith, but then it isn't just faith as a feeling. It is specifically, says in verse 27, For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. This is how we become children of God. If we've done that, have we continued to faithfully accept the pattern of Christianity and to live it in our lives? If you need any help in those areas, say one last time, I'm going to say, please contact us here at the Central Church of Christ in Columbia, Kentucky. Thank you for listening.